Please welcome Dr. Mark as he shares the genius of Steve Jobs, How to Think Like a Disruptor. Can you all hear me? Good. Um, I like to do some psychological housekeeping occasionally. So what you need to know is I am a role-specific extrovert. What that means is I'm very shy, but when I'm up here, I have to sort of parking lot that because if I don't, then my shyness can sort of undercut what I'm trying to communicate. And I think I'm preaching to the choir because as I went out there, I could see the relief that people had after their second drink last night. So I, I think I'm among, amongst friends. Uh, it took me three, but th th there you go. So a couple of the uh, companies that we work with, and you've probably uh, uh, heard of some of them. And these are the books coming up. And this, this a little bit of my journey to gotta have it. So I speak to a number of executive tech startup roundtables, and many of these are CEOs. And so what I've been speaking to them about were things like uh, how to listen better, how to have real influence, how to get out of your own way. And I was doing pretty well, but something that I've discovered is that CEOs, especially entrepreneurs, hate dealing with people issues. I mean, you know, that they, and part of that is they want to keep their vision and they want to stay on it and keep their strategy. And What's interesting is all the first three books are, that's nice, that's nice, but this talking to crazy is a gotta have it. I, I mean, I just share the title with people and they say, uh, I've gotta have that. So what I would like to do, and, and so what happened is I am a people hacker and I'm going to show you a video from the lost interview for Steve, with Steve Jobs and there are four points that I'm gonna cover and I'm going to cover them in various iterations until you're able to take it home. And also, one thing that I like to do is I like to set impossible goals for myself. And so if my ADD doesn't kick in, I'm going to ask you at the end if I've achieved this. How many think I'll be able to do that? Raise your hands. Good, good. I, I like skeptics and not to mention the cynics. <laughs> cynics. Or we don't raise our hands for anything, so I can't ask you. So if we can run the Steve Jobs video. It would be helpful with the sound. Yes, I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. And still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this someday. So there were four elements there, and I'll point them out, but I, I, I want to give you three more examples until you're saying, so what are they? Um, now, I started out, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a psychiatrist, and I used to be a suicide interventionist. And for many years, that's what I did. Uh, and, and there's four elements to the story I'm going to tell you. Uh, to make it relevant, raise your hands if you've ever known of someone from your school, college, community, family, who thought of suicide and or committed suicide. Raise your hands. So if you look around, I think it's, what, 80%. And so what I'm going to ask you to do, if you can, is to try to put yourself in the shoes of what they must be feeling. And, and as you listen to this story, find out what the four things were that happened with this person. So many years ago, I was seeing highly suicidal people. And what would happen is my first mentor started the suicide prevention centers in Washington and Los Angeles. And, this, and he was on uh, staff at UCLA. And he would see still suicidal people who had to be discharged. Now, they had to be discharged because it was part of their personality. They weren't acutely suicidal, but you can't keep them there forever. So he would refer them to me out in the community. 
And it would always refer them to me with the same wonderful, schmoozy, manipulative thing he'd say, Mark. He'd be on the phone with them. This is Ed. I'm with this lovely young woman. I'm with this handsome young man. They're in a lot of pain, Mark. You could help them see them. And so it was always the same conversation. And so I was seeing one woman that I would call Nancy, and I'd seen her for about eight months. She'd made three suicide attempts before I saw her. She'd been in the hospital three to four months every year prior to this UCLA hospitalization. And I didn't think I was making any progress. She, whenever she came in, she rarely made eye contact. Uh, if you're me, she would be like this. And I didn't think I was getting anywhere, except it was about six, eight months. It was the longest she'd gone without a suicide attempt. And on one Monday, I had just finished moonlighting at a state hospital. You know, you, you go to a hospital to cover for the other doctors, and so uh, you pick up some extra money. And I was a little bit overtired. So any of you who have been up 36 hours, you know how your physiology, your teeth, your sphincters, parts of your mind, don't work too well. So there I am on Monday, and I come in, I'm kind of sleep deprived, and she's like this. And suddenly, all the color in the room turned to black and white. And I'm young, and I'm thinking, oh, this is interesting. And then it turned cold and chilling. And I thought I was having a stroke or a seizure. Now, I'm a, uh, an MD, I'm not a psychologist. So since she's not looking at me, I do a neurologic exam on myself. And so I'm going like this, and I'm going like this, and I'm going like this, and I'm going like this. And I, I, I say, well, I'm all here. No stroke, no seizure. And then I had this crazy idea that I was looking out at the world through her eyes. And I leaned into it. And I got to tell you, it got worse. And years later, I spoke to uh, Reverend Jim Kowalski from St. John the Divine Gothic Cathedral in Manhattan. And he said, oh, you went to the dark night of the soul. I said, I'm not even the same religion. This is, I don't understand this stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, because I was sleep deprived, I shared something that normally I wouldn't have. So imagine you're Nancy, three attempts, and you're like this. And, and I said this to her. I said, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad. And I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I'll miss you. And maybe I'll understand why you had to, to get out of the pain. And I thought to myself, I just blew it. And then she looked at me. First time she looked at me, it was like that movie Awakenings. And she looked at me. And I thought she was going to say, thank you, I'm overdue. And I said, what are you thinking? She looked me right in the eye. And she said, if you really can understand why I might have to kill myself to get out of the pain, maybe I won't need to. And then she came back. I think she gave up her suicidality at that point. And by the way, uh, so there's four points there I'm going to refer back to. And that little video about Steve Jobs, in my mind, as I've become a student of Steve Jobs, I think he was describing the moment in his life when he went from hustler to visionary, when he saw the graphical user interface. Uh, let's see, here's, here's another instance. Uh, Eli Brode is a multi-billionaire in Los Angeles. And he rarely <coughs> gives credit to other people. He's a good guy. And to get him to quote you, it's probably a, a billion to one shot. And to get him to compliment you, it's probably at another billion. And here's the backstory, and I want you to think, what are the four steps already? And then I'm just going to frustrate you a little bit after that, and I'll give you the four steps. So the back story is I had met Eli, and he asked me some management issue, because I know something about management and people issues and difficult things. And, and we were at some informal thing. And I said, I wouldn't do that, Eli. You know, it's not going to work. This will happen. He said, it's already happened. I said, why don't you try this? And he said, well, that's pretty good. And so I called him about a year later. I said, I don't know if you remember me. We spoke. And uh, billionaires don't necessarily take my call, but he knew me, so he took the call. And I said, Eli, are you ever going to write a book on philanthropy? And he has more energy than this room combined. I don't know how, how he does it. He says, Mark, I'm in a rush. It's always in a rush. I said, well, are you ever going to write a book on philanthropy? I, I mean, I'm never going to write one. i got to go, Mark. Uh, here are the four steps. I said, seven seconds, Eli. Wealth is what you take from the world. Worth is what you give back. Say that again, Mark. Uh, I repeated it. He said, that's pretty good, Mark. He said, it's yours. I'm not going to write a book. Take it. You help our city, goodbye. 
Forbes magazine calls me uh, six months later and says, we got a quote from Eli Broad for this article, and he's attributing it to you. Is it true? I said, yes. And so that's how I ended up there. Uh, and still one of the better quotes I've ever come up with. <laughs> also, uh, let's see. Next is, um, how many of you know the secret of the FedEx logo? Raise your hands. <coughs> Okay. Raise your hands if you don't know the secret of the FedEx logo. Raise them high, raise them high. Okay. Now I want you to play along with me. If you don't know the secret of the FedEx logo, cross your arms. Okay. And when I show you the FedEx logo, uh, I want the people who know the secret to scream it out. So one, two, three. What's the secret to the FedEx logo? It's the arrow between the E and the X. So here's what happened. These are the four parts. Again, uh, those of you who see FedEx every day, and you know, we tend to want to be in control of our environment, and you thought you knew everything. I mean, it's right in front of you. Uh, when you saw that arrow, Something inside you wanted you, and some of you did, I watched it, wanted to actually uncross your arms, your kind of you know, skeptical arms, and, it, and you went, oh my God, I never saw that. Right? And so when you see the logo now, all of you who have never seen it, what are you going to notice now? Okay. And if you're stuck in traffic, you run out of small talk, and you're a smarty pants, and this is in front of you, what are you going to say to the person next to you? You see the arrow. So those are the four steps. So here is what happened. And this is the secret formula to all of those things. The secret to gotta have it is whoa, wow, hmm, yes. Whoa, wow, hmm, yes. Uh, for Steve Jobs, what was the whoa? I saw, they showed me three things. I didn't even see two of them. I just saw the graphical user interface. What was the wow? It was the best thing I'd ever seen in my life. What was the hmm? They, they got it right, but uh, they had a lot of flaws. And what was the yes? In 10 minutes, I knew that one day all computers would run this way. For Nancy, what was the whoa, wow, hmm, yes? It was, I'm not alone in hell. When I talk about suicide, I talk about despair. And despair, if you go D-E-S, hyphen P-A-I-R, it means unpaired with hope, hopeless, unpaired with meaning, meaningless, <coughs> worthless, pointless, useless. And when they all line up, as they did for Robin Williams, you pair with death to take the pain away. And what happened is I paired with Nancy, and so the despair went away. And I think the whoa, wow was, I think I can live. And the yes was, I think, I just didn't want to be alone in this. Uh, for Eli Broad, uh, the woe was, say it again. The wow was, that's pretty good, Mark. The hmm is, I gotta go, but I got a call from Forbes, so he wrote it down. And the yes, I'm in Forbes. And then the FedEx, the woe was, you saw the arrow that you hadn't seen before. The wow was, I see that logo every day and I never noticed this. I must be oblivious. And then when you saw it, you went, wow, it's there. It's not an optical illusion. And the hmm is, uh, that, that's interesting. And then if you're stuck and we're all a little bit shy, you run the small talk, there's your guess. Make sense? Now, let's see. Uh, how do you trigger whoa? Now, many of us are stuck in our own paradigm. But one of the things even stuck people are open to is, when, when they say, I can't believe what I'm seeing, the FedEx, I can't believe what I'm hearing, or, or seeing was also uh, Steve Jobs, I can't believe what I'm hearing, uh, that was Eli Broad, I can't believe what I'm feeling, that was Nancy. And what do these lead to? They lead to fascination, <clears throat> amazement, or astonishment. So fascination, amazement, or astonishment break through and break up people's paradigms. Even if you're the most analytical, flirting with Asperger's, with a 
you know, a hint of ADD. Uh, I think that covers a number of the people here. You go to Disneyland with your grandchild and you see the look in their face, you have to be stone cold dead to not just be amazed at what you see. And what does the wow lead to? You go, hmm, I can do something with this. That's what Steve Jobs said. I don't know what they're doing, but there's a lot of people, uh, and the genius of Steve Jobs, and I wrote a blog about this, is Steve Jobs was invited everywhere because he had courage, he was brazen, uh, and later on in life he became a genius, but he didn't belong anywhere. He was an outlier. The irony is Steve Jobs belonged to the future, but because he outsmarted himself, he never got to see it. And so what does the hmm lead to? Yes. And my view of innovation, and you can see I, I like to take words and spin them. To me, it means something that gets through to people's inertia and their defenses, and inside causes a standing ovation, causes them to say, yes, I'm going to do that. Is this make, are you tracking with this? Is this making sense intuitive? So why do you need woe before wow? I'll have to go through this uh, quickly, but to me it's the most fascinating. Uh, if you think of evolution and, and, uh, from the zoological side of the tracks, we've gone from an amoeba to human being, and what happened is our brain developed, our primate brain, which is 250,000 years old, our mammalian brain is 65 million, and our reptilian fight or flight brain is uh, 250 million. Uh, and our primate brain allowed us to override our emotions and our fight or flight thing. So that's all good. Here's, the, uh, here's what happens is it also allowed us to specialize. And there's something I call the specialist dilemma. And what happens is that the more specialized you are, the more narrow you are in terms of what you're aligned with in the world to cause you to feel competent, confident, and in control. This is why there's a number of public companies that do not know the name of the CTO. They just want the trains to run on time. They, ju they, just, they just want to know how it works. And so why you need the woe is because you need to disrupt that inertia. Otherwise, people will stay in where they feel uh, competent, confident in control. And so what does that is, again, uh, uh, the woe will lead to, I added delight there. And one company, one of my favorite companies, how many of you have heard of IDEO? Now, unless they've changed, one of the, uh, one of the things that IDEO practices, and my last living mentor was a fellow named Warren Bennis, big leadership guy, died in August, and I miss him every day. Um, but one of, the, one of his favorite phrases was, be a first class noticer. Because when you notice, it's different than looking, watching, and seeing. Now, we don't have time, but if I had you close your eyes and then open them as if you were blind and seeing for the first time and say, what do you notice? When you start looking at something, you'll be in whatever you're noticing. It'll take you away from who you are. And IDEO sends out sociologists, computer scientists, anthropologists, psychologists, and whatnot out there and say, go observe, go observe what astonishes and delights people, find out what they're looking at. Go see what frustrates them, find out what frustrates them. And then come back and tell us what you notice. And that's part of what fuels their innovation. Um, so I, I can see I'm getting the, uh, the, the hook hint here. So to end, um, which is another one of my favorite quotes, that you really don't discover new things until you let go of your paradigm. And as scary as it is, it's something that you need to do because as Steve Jobs would say, life's, life is given to us to make changes in the world. Otherwise, why are we here? Thank you. And if you go to the site, goulstongroup.com, we have a PDF which goes on about the formula. Under free resources, go to goulstongroup.com. You'll see a button. You'll get a bunch of other things. So thank you. <laughs>